This morning we are going to finish our three-part series <laughs> on pressing on for the prize. We have been in Philippians chapter 3, looking at verses 12 through 16, piece by piece over the last couple of weeks. <clears throat> and this morning we will come to a close in this section. And then next week when we gather together on Christmas, uh, we will have a special uh, time together of singing and scripture reading and a uh, clear gospel message. So if you have any friends or family that will be here that needs to hear the gospel, it's going to be plain and simple next week. So I want you to bring them uh, and worship with us at that time. This morning, again, we are finishing up this section on pressing on for the prize. We will be looking at Philippians chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. So far, this section was a continuation of what we finished in verses 10 through 11. Uh, we looked at the fact that to know Christ and the power of His resurrection is to live a life marked by suffering, sacrifice, and sanctification. And then into verse 12, into this section on pressing on for the prize, we learned that as we press on to the prize in our pursuit of the resurrection from the dead, from verse 11, we must have a humble awareness of reality of God and of ourselves. And then last week we looked at <clears throat> the fact that pressing on for the prize includes past, present, and future activity. We, we are told, Paul tells us uh, to forget the past, to strain in the present and look to the future. This morning, uh, we see here in verses 15 and 16 that pressing on for the prize is for those who are maturing in Christ. So if you will stand with me for the reading of God's Word. I'll begin in verse 12 for the context and read through verse 16. Paul says, Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me His own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Father, this morning, teach us by your word as we continue to think about pressing on for the prize. Show us what that looks like, the mindset that it takes. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I hope you've noticed, and this is not in my notes, <laughs> I hope you have noticed uh, since we have started in this study of Philippians, how important it is to come week after week, because everything builds on the week before. Uh, in order to understand, this, if you just read 15 and 16, if I didn't read those other verses, we'd be like, what in the world? How are you going to build a message off of this? How are you going to build a sermon off of let those of us who are mature think this way uh, and hold true to what we've attained? It, it, without the context, it doesn't make any sense. So I hope that you are seeing for the last 10 months, 9 months, it's 9 months, 9 and a half months, how important... Um, coming regularly is for understanding uh, these letters. The, the whole counsel of God uh, needs the context. Con scripture interprets Scripture. If you miss a week or you miss a couple weeks in a row, uh, we're not mad at you. I'm not mad at you. But you might want to go back and watch those sermons or the next one might not make sense to you. So this morning, <clears throat> verse 15 and 16. 
Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. First, he says, let those of us who are mature think this way. Let those of us. If to this point in our working through this section that you thought Paul was arrogantly speaking only of himself and the fact that he was striving and pressing on for the prize on his own, or that this kind of thinking was only for the apostles and those like Paul, Paul says it right here. Let those of us think this way. This way of thinking that Paul has been describing over these past, especially past couple weeks that we've been looking at pressing on for the prize this way of thinking is not just for Paul. It's not just for pastors. It's not just for me. It's not just for the leaders in the church. It's not just uh, for even just for the older believers. But it is for all of us. It is for you too. Paul says, let those of us. It is those who, it is for those. This way of thinking is the kind of thinking that is for those who are maturing, growing, being sanctified, becoming more like Christ. Paul, again, is shifting in this little phrase, let those of us, changing the pronouns. Not the way some people are changing pronouns but changing the pronouns in this paragraph to, to, to shift. So what he's talking about, instead of just me, I'm pressing on, I'm doing this, but let those of us. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't single himself out as the model, the only model, the, 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 the prime example of all of this way of thinking. He puts himself in the context of the fellowship of the saints, of the church, of the rest of those who are following after Christ. So he says, let those of us who are mature think this way. Maturity is a requirement for the Christian. I don't mean to say that you must be mature right now. <laughs> but what I'm saying is maturing is a requirement for the believer. This is simply another way of talking about sanctification, which we have been discussing all along. Growing in Christ's likeness, maturing towards that end. This is not uh, a, a something that is just for, again, certain individuals, Paul and the apostles and leaders and preachers. It's for all of us. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 20, Paul says this to the Corinthians, Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. And Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, the author of Hebrews says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you, again, the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. We are called to mature. We are called to maturity, to, to completedness, to perfection. All of these are the same term. Mature, this word here in verse 15, is the noun version of, of the verb we used in verse 12 for perfect. Same term. So verse 12, not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, is a verb. But down in verse 15, those who are mature, the noun form of that same word used in verse 12. So since this is the context of the word, we must read this word with that in mind. What did we learn about, again, this is the importance of being here on, uh, every week, what did we see from this term in verse 12? Well, like the verse says, I have not already obtained this or I'm already perfect. The word here, 
as we have discussed, is in that passive voice, which means that it's being done to him. It's, being, it's something done outside, from outside of himself. It means to be perfected. God was perfecting Paul, is what he said. Not that I have already been perfected. God is the one perfecting him. It is a work done by God. And also, we saw that this perfecting is not done yet. So mature here in this verse then does not mean sinless perfection. Paul cannot mean that. He just said something completely opposite of that. Let those of us who are mature... Mature cannot mean sinless perfection. And beyond just Paul not contradicting himself, he would be contradicting other parts of Scripture. 1 John chapter 1, if we say we have no sin, or if we, if we say we are without sin, we are liars, or we're calling God a liar, and the truth is not in us. So we're not talking about maturity in that sinless perfection. Is being perfected. Mature does not mean sinless perfection, but it is God perfecting, as we overcome sin in our lives by the power of His Holy Spirit in order that we might become more like our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the perfectly righteous one. Amen. So that is what that word here means. That's what it means to be mature, complete, perfect. It's the same word, Christian, that we are growing, we are being perfected. It is something that is being done and will be done. So I would even bring out the fact that he says those who are mature. It is, is a promise. It's a future expectation, though he knows he's not there yet. I am perfect in the sight of God. I am mature in the sight of God. I am sanctified completely in the sight of God, yet I am not perfect in this life yet. That's what Paul continues to teach us this word means. It is not sinless perfection. It is being perfected, being matured, growing in Christ likeness. So again, it might seem like Paul is contradicting himself if you look at these individual statements completely separately. Verse 12, he says, I'm not already perfect. And then <laughs> verse 15 says that those of us who are perfect think this way. Uh, don't don't fall into that trap. This is where uh, atheists and those who uh, like to try to poke holes in the Bible will go, see? I mean, he, he contradicted himself. Well, no, he didn't. Not if you understand what the term means. So when we realize this is all in the same context and even this, the same paragraph and in succeeding sentences, it changes how we must read it. Because there are no contradictions in the Bible... What we see here, then, is not a contradiction, but a paradox. What we see here is that the perfect Christian, or the mature Christian, is the one who recognizes that he is not perfect. <laughs> the mature Christian is the one who is continually pressing on, continually striving forward, like we talked about last week, towards the prize. It is the one who continues to pursue righteousness, to pursue knowledge of God through His Word, to continue to put off the old man and to put on the new. It is not someone who thinks they have arrived and no longer needs to grow in knowledge or be perfected. This is not the person who thinks he knows all he needs to know and has nothing left to learn or grow in. No, the mature Christian is constantly growing. Uh, let me say here, um, I am incredibly encouraged by why I see a, a many of you in this church. As your pastor, it is my job to look after you. I am constantly watching to see if you are growing. And one way I have to know whether you are growing or not is what Paul is actually saying here. Those who are maturing, those who are being perfected, those who are growing in Christ's likeness, think like this. So when I see men 
and women who are, maybe I shouldn't put this part, twice my age, sign up for a men's or women's discipleship group because they want to keep maturing, keep learning, keep growing. I see this way of thinking that Paul describes. Now, don't misread that. I don't mean to say that if, uh, if you're not signed up for those things, then you're not maturing or growing. I just mean that I see that as one way to recognize what Paul's saying here. And I praise the Lord for his kindness in allowing me to see that in our church body. It is fantastic and wonderful that God has given us these kinds of checks, examinations. Mature people think like this. Okay, so how do I know if they're maturing? Well, they think like that. Oh, well, I've, I, I see some of that. Praise the Lord. When that's not happening, that's where we come into trouble. So he says, let those of us let those of us together who are mature or maturing, perfect, being perfected, think this way. I believe that what we see here can also apply to something else, something we commonly see or, or, or at least something I, I know I have seen. There is sometimes the temptation to think, again, opposite of what Paul is saying here, that we are the only ones who are maturing. That we are the only ones who know the truth and live by the truth. And it can, as I have seen, cause some to grow cold in their love towards other people. These kinds of people are quick to argue rather than listen. They're unwilling to be patient with those who are not as knowledgeable or who are immature in some aspects of the faith. I'll say this clearly. Arrogance and selfishness have no place in the mature believer. Yes, there are those who are more mature, more knowledgeable, more complete in the Word, and there are those that are immature in the faith. True. But that's where discipleship comes in. That is where having the proper church structure comes in. Having elders who teach the word, preach the word, counsel the word publicly and privately in order to equip the saints to help them to mature in Christ. There is an us. As Paul said, we should all be striving for maturity, making disciples, looking out for each other, helping one another to mature. And those who are more mature, or who are maturing, will be known by this way of thinking that Paul describes here. So let us keep ourselves in check and not let ourselves, or let the knowledge we have puff us up, but instead let it cause us to love even better as we become more like Christ. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. If, if in anything you think otherwise, if in any of this you think otherwise, put it a different way, if you think differently than what I, Paul, have been teaching you here, God will reveal it to you too. The, the same God who revealed this kind of thinking that I have, Paul says, will reveal the same exact thing to you. In, in other words, it will not be different. God will tell you the same thing I am, te I am saying, basically is Paul saying here. If you don't like what I'm saying, I'm only saying what God says. And personally, as a preacher, I love this attitude that Paul has. I'm only telling you what God says. That's what Paul's saying here. If you think anything different than what I'm saying, 
well, you're, God's going to tell you the same thing. It's not going to go like, Paul, God, Paul told me this, and I don't think he's right, and I don't like it. Well, that's, no, that I, that's what I said. Do that. That kind of thinking. That way of understanding. Well, what he has said, I said. That's what Paul's saying here. If you think any different than this, you have to take it up with God. God will reveal this to you also. That does not mean that God will give you some unique sign from heaven or speak directly to you in some audible or otherwise supernatural way like some say. I'm waiting for God to tell me what He wants me to do. This kind of special revelation from God, God speaking, only comes through this. This is God's special revelation to you. I, I want to hear God speak. Read it out loud. He's not going to give you something different than He has already revealed. This is His special revelation to us. Everything He wants us to know, to think, to do, is right here. We, we don't have to look somewhere else. He will reveal it to you also. does not mean He's going to somehow, by osmosis or some weird other kind of way, get it into your head. No, it's here. He will open your eyes to see, to understand, to believe. His Word. God will reveal it to you also. It only comes through this kind of revelation. We can know some true things about God through creation and a sense of morality that God has made us with, as Romans 1 and 2 explains. That is God's general revelation to mankind. But the revealed will of God in Christ and the church and God's people in salvation and all the promises of the future are all found in only one place, God's Word. This is God's special revelation to us. If you think anything different from what God says, and in particular about what Paul has been teaching there in chapter 3, that salvation comes by grace through faith alone in Christ alone, and not by any good works. And that the resurrection of the, the dead, eternity in heaven with God, is the prize worth striving for. If in any of these things you think otherwise, God will teach or reveal to you the same exact thing. Paul, perhaps unknown to him at the time of his writing, was telling them God's revealed will. God by the Holy Spirit, through Paul, was teaching those Philippians, and now he is teaching us through the same revealed word, the very same things of God. It's not something different. It is God's word. What Paul is saying to the Philippians is that God has already spoken. He has already revealed his will to us in his word. And this way of thinking that Paul is talking about these ways of thinking, excuse me, that Paul is talking about are exactly the same things that God will reveal also to them. As they mature, God will make it clear in time as they are maturing. There are things we don't understand until we get to the point where we can understand them. Go back to Hebrews 5.14, the rest of that, that verse. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. He reveals more of Himself and what we need in His Word as we mature. Through constant practice. One commentator said this. Open quote. But of course, if you do not read the Bible as you should, in an in-depth manner, this will not happen. God gives no special revelation today. His word has been given to enlighten you about what you need to know. 
He will work through that word to teach you those things you need to understand. That is a marvelous promise. It is an encouragement for every believer to read the scriptures and to faithfully attend a church where the Bible is expounded and applied to his life. Close quote. John chapter 6, verse 45, Jesus said, It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. God has revealed all he wants us to know. Those who are mature, who have heard and learned from God the Father through his word, will come to Christ to learn more, to grow more, to be perfected and mature in the faith, to become more like Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only... Let us hold true to what we have attained. So far you're with me, but you may say, I don't think God has revealed everything to me yet. True. There is a lifetime of learning. There is a lifetime of learning what God has revealed in His Scriptures. But ignorance of all of God's Word... Is, not a, is no excuse for not doing what you know He has said. You may not know all of what He has said, but that's no excuse for not doing what you know He has said. He says, only let us hold true to what we have attained. In other words, you must live up to what you have learned. You and I must live in accordance with what we do know, not with what we do not know. For example, and really you can use any uh, area of growth in Christ's likeness from God's Word as an example here. This is just one of many. Uh, it may not yet be revealed to some of you men that those who are husbands and fathers are responsible to be the pastor of your family. Maybe that's because you're still a young man, not married yet. Maybe it's because you became a believer after you were married or after you had kids and are still relatively new in the faith. Whatever the reason, you have yet to learn that and learn all that that means and how to do it. And yet, if you're in Christ and you are maturing, that will be part of your growing process. But in the meantime... You do know something about God's Word and what He commands you. You're a believer. And you know, as a believer, that you should be telling others about Christ. So those who are in your home, whether it's just a wife or wife and kids, you have the responsibility to share the gospel with them so that they know Christ. They know the gospel so that they can repent of their sins and put their faith in Christ. So, so you must at least obey that. Even if you're not being the full <laughs> biblical husband and father that God's word teaches us about. You haven't attained that yet. But then as you do what you do know, you will learn more about what being the pastor of your home means. You begin to do more and grow in Christ's likeness in that way. The level of understanding of God's Word that you do know should match the level of obedience in the way you live your life. Let me say that again. The level of God's Word that you do know should be the level of obedience in the way that you live your life. We should be obedient to what we know. Those who know that they are, as my example, know that they are to be the pastors of their family, should be doing the things they know they should be doing in their homes to care for and help their family grow in Christ. No excuses. 
Now, of course, we fail. Okay, let's, let's leave that in there. We're not talking about perfection, sinless perfection. We're talking about maturing. Of course, we fail at times. And what that means then, that there's always room to grow. You have never arrived, as Paul has talked about. We are not perfect yet. There's always room to grow. There's always room for maturing. But, we can't, but what we can't do is, as some do, unfortunately, use ignorance as the reason for not doing what God has said. Rather, what we should see is our ignorance should, should rather give us a reason to grow. Not, oh, I don't know that thing, um, so I don't have to do it. Again, you can fill in the blanks with anything else besides just men pastoring their families. This, this is any area of growth, any, uh, anything that the Scriptures talks about. We cannot say, I'm not going to do it because I haven't learned it. Or, even worse, I'm not going to read the Bible because then I would be accountable to what it says. That's not a Christian. Maturing, being a mature Christian that Paul's talking about here, means that we are constantly and continually growing. And just like a person grows and learns new things from a baby, walking and talking and other basic things, we need to hold true those things that we have learned early in order to grow and become more mature. Infants move out of infancy as they build upon their ability to walk and talk and think, learning more and more as they mature into adulthood. As we learn to do the things God revealed to us in His Word, we are being prepared for more and more. Why? To fully enjoy the life of a maturing follower of Jesus. There is more rejoicing to be had, like Paul does over and over again. Can, just consider that example for a second. Paul rejoices again and again in situations and in circumstances and even in, in people, in churches where they are doing things really, really wrong. How can he do so? Because he's mature in his thinking. He sees things that other people are, aren't seeing because they're distracted by sin and other distractions. So we grow. We start small. We start as newborn babes, but we grow into adulthood as we learn to do the things God reveals to us in His Word. We are be being prepared for more and more to fully enjoy the life of a maturing follower of Christ. There is more to the Christian life, brother and sister, than milk. Milk gets boring after a while because it's just milk. But it's necessary for life. We need that to start with. We need to hold fast to that. We need that to grow. But it is to grow. The more we mature, the more we recognize that there is more and more and more. And how is it possible that we can continue to mature and never fully be perf perfect in this life? Because our God is infinite. He is never-ending. He is eternal. You experience more and more and, and grow deeper and wider uh, as you grow because God is infinite. When we taste and see that the Lord is good, we want more. And the more we get, the more we see yet to come. And so we press on to the prize by grace through faith to attain to the resurrection of the dead and the eternity with God in heaven. Those of us, let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal it to you also. Are you maturing, Christian? Are you growing? If not, you should be. If you don't think you are able, <laughs> you can. It is for us. 
Or perhaps you feel stuck, like you aren't growing. Perhaps the problem is that you're ignoring some very plain thing that you must attain to first. Here's another fun one. Perhaps you know that gossip is wrong. And you know that you fall into that continuously. And by the way, it's easy to do so. Why? Because gossip has become a respectable sin in the church. But you simply ignore it. You don't take any steps to grow in Christ's likeness in this area of your life. Don't get frustrated by that. Get to work. There, there's nothing keeping you from growing in Christ's likeness in that area of your life except you. Begin to work on obeying God in this area of your life. By God's grace, you'll begin to grow. See victory in this area of your life and growth. Maturity may again continue. Again, I just used gossip, but could it be anything in your life that you know that God's Word teaches about, but you do not obey it? If this is you, that's why you're stuck. Repent and get to work. If, but if you need help... That's where the us comes in. Talk to someone in the church who seems to be more mature in that area and let them help you. We all need it. I have people I talk to to help me grow in maturity, to be a better Christian, to be a more Christ-like in different areas of my life. We all need that. We all need brothers and sisters that we can go to. And we have each other. And you have me. As we come to this new year, we're coming to the end of this... Wow, it's already crazy coming to the end of this year. And a new year. Many of us begin to think about what to change and do different this year. How about a renewed desire to grow up in Christ? Here's some practical steps. I've mentioned our men's and women's training opportunities coming up this year. Why not step up in faith and be dedicated to pursuing maturity together with others in the church in this way? Or what if that means that this year you just commit to being more dedicated in coming to Sunday morning, Sunday school, worship service, Sunday evening discipleship, Wednesday evening Bible study, or just discipline yourself in daily Bible reading and prayer. Doing family worship in the home. Listen, whatever it looks like, just don't sit idly by. God has revealed to us what He wants for us to know and to do in His special revelation to us in His Word. Spend time in His Word in these different ways. Begin drinking the milk if you have to. And as you obey what you learn, you will grow and begin to eat the meat soon enough. One thing I have learned, you're either moving forward or you're moving back. You are never just coasting. So then, let us, by the grace of God alone, with renewed desire, press on for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. My brothers and sisters, let those of us who are mature, who are growing by God's grace, think this way and look forward to what God will do. Amen?